So Victor, tell me what it's like to sort of be here right now in this moment. The, the clock behind you, which we can't see on camera, says minus 37, 28, 45. That's amazing. Just under 38 hours to launching Artemis 1. It's unreal. I mean, it sounds a little cliche, but you know, to, to be at the place where the Apollo missions launched from, all those uh, shuttle launches happened from, and I actually launched from that next door neighbor launch pad right there just under two years ago. But it's still surreal to be here. This is one of my favorite places on the planet. Uh, and that's just any day of the week. But when there's a big rocket like SLS and, and Orion sitting over there, it's just uh, the buzz here, the energy. Uh, it, it's really special. And, and my favorite part about this is the excitement of all the NASA employees who have worked hard for years to make this happen. What is that excitement like? What is it at right now? I mean, you know, you weren't born when Apollo was, was happening. So I'm yeah. sure there's really nothing to equate this to, is there? Well, it, I mean, you know, growing up and in, in, in appreciating Apollo and having that being a, a motivational force in your life, it's really neat to like stand on the precipice of maybe the next thing like that happening, knowing it. We call things moonshots when humans do great things, right? And so our generation doesn't have that, though. We look back at Apollo uh, for that inspiration. And so now our generation is going to have its own moonshots. And so that's, I think, a part of it for all of us. And, and I love the fact that it's connected, though, the, the legacy of, of Apollo and Apollo Soyuz and, and the shuttle and ISS and our, our partnerships with SpaceX and Boeing. They're, they're, I, people say this is a marathon, not a sprint. I say it's actually a relay race. And so those programs have all informed what we're doing now, but they've handed us the stick and now it's time for us to run our best leg. And so this is going to open the door for us to send humans to the moon. And I mean, I just, it's hard to imagine anything more exciting for, for people all over the world, right? I think people are gonna be tuning in from all corners of the earth to watch this thing on Monday. But this mission is also not just charting new paths in space, it's also sort of crossing um, historic barriers in gender, race, yeah. uh, ethnicity, culture. Can you yeah. talk about that a bit? Well, of course, you know, you heard the line, it, it originally was, we're gonna send the first woman and the next man to the moon. And then it became, you know, we're gonna send the first woman and the first person of color to the moon. And I'll say, here's what I, what I think about that. Our office is diverse enough, we represent America. And because of that, it, we, we make our boss's job actually ch challenging, we make his job hard, because he's gotta pick some of us. Uh, and I think all of us are ready, trained, and capable of, of making this mission a success. Uh, but then I think the fact that our leadership recognizes uh, the past and how maybe it wasn't equitable, that we can do something about that now. And, and the astronaut office that we have today looks like America, so it's easy to do. But the fact that our leadership recognizes that they have a role in it as well to make sure that it happens and to support and encourage the continued dialogue about that, I think is really important. And so it is encouraging, and I think all people should, should feel supported by this effort. Victor, when you sit back and you think about this, does the reality that you may be someone who charts some kind of historic milestone for humanity, is it something that seeps into your mind often while you're going through training or while you're talking to the media or while you're doing this? Or, or is, does it have a special place in your mind to prepare for this? No, I think those kind of things can distract you. And I'm an operator. You know, I love this. I love the business, the hands on, the eyes, the teamwork, working with these amazing people. And I really value the mission. I love having a mission and a great crew to accomplish that mission with. And those things to me are distractors. You know, there was a lot of talk about that for my mission to ISS, and I didn't focus on that. I kept my head down and just did the work. Uh, and so, but, I, but again, I do think it's important. You know, there are little kids out there that look up to us and say, I wanna do that. But more important that inspiration drives decisions, right? It drives behavior. And so some little kids going, I wanna be like that, and I'm gonna study this, and I'm gonna eat my vegetables, and I'm gonna be a good person. And that, that to me is valuable, no matter what those kids look like. People keep asking me, you know, is it meaningful to you that little black kids look up to you and, and say they wanna be like you? You know what, let's be honest, I represent America. I'm a Naval officer and I work for NASA. I represent America. And little white kids, little Mexican kids, little Hispanic kids, little Iranian kids uh, follow what we're doing because this is maybe one of the most recognizable symbols in the universe. And, and I think that that's really important and I take that very seriously. What is the most challenging part of the job ahead for you? The most challenging part of this job for me is the time away from my family. Uh, but you know what? I, I, I'm, a, I'm a member of a group that is serving the people, right? This is the people stuff. Uh, that rocket was built by the American people, literally. Uh, and so I, I, I work for the people. And so I, I balance my leaving my family, my people, to go serve the people. And both of those are very important to me, but that's the most challenging aspect of this job for me is the time away from my loved ones. Uh, but I think it's important. What we do is meaningful to America and to humanity at large. And so I think it's important for us to explore space, to explore the cosmos for all people, especially now when we can do it by all people. Is there anything you can do mentally to prepare for a mission to the moon? 
I, I mean, not, nobody uh, in the program right now has ever been there before. There isn't like relative experience you can go to unless you're talking to an Apollo astronaut to help prepare you for what it's going to be like to reach the surface of the moon. How do you get ready and how, how do you do this? Because it's not been done in 50 years. There's going to be a great training program. We've got a great team of people that are thinking about how to train astronauts for this mission. One of the primary things all astronauts have to do, though, is integrate all of that and then take it into space and know how space is different than what you do on the ground. Uh, there's going to always be that no matter where you go, low Earth orbit or beyond on the moon or onto Mars. Uh, but there's also, like you said, talking to Apollo astronauts. We still have a few. We have some flight controllers and, and, and flight directors that were around then. And so being able to talk to those folks and, and get leadership lessons, operational things from them is, is very important. That legacy, get, you know, passing the baton is a very important part of human spaceflight. But I think personally, I'm a little bit more of a philosophical astronaut, I would say. And I think it's important for us also to recognize when you go do something like this, to not just know there are unknowns, but to embrace it. You, you are not prepared. You're not as prepared as you can be if you don't expect something to catch you off guard. And so knowing that it's gonna happen, you're gonna be able to process those emotions faster. And instead of going, oh my God, is this really happening? You're gonna go, yeah, God, thanks for the preparation. And you're gonna do the next right thing. And so knowing that you're going to a place not many human beings have been, I think is an important part of preparing for something like flying Artemis II or Artemis III to the moon. Do you think the general public is invested, educated, and excited about this mission as they might have been for Apollo? You know what? Because of the internet and the connectivity and the, and the communication uh, that's possible nowadays and how much easier it is, I think people are pretty well informed. Uh, the educated piece, hopefully they, they listen to us when we talk about things like the, the primary test objective being the heat shield. And, and as my friend Dr. Love reminded me that the, the heat loading on the shield is proportional to the cube of your velocity, right? Those are really important, big things. And so hopefully the public uh, is following that closely to know this is not a walk in the park. There's a lot about this mission that could go wrong and, and that's gonna help us to send people back to the moon. And so I think part of that falls on us to do that advocacy. But I think that the general public is. And all of that comes together, I think, to, to create, like, I, I truly believe there's worldwide excitement about this. I mean, I think people are going to be watching from all corners uh, of the earth uh, to see what we're doing. And, and hopefully more people have access to that connectivity and can, and can share in that moment with us. You'll be on this stage on Monday for Artemis One, broadcasting for NASA to talk about the mission from yeah. an astronaut perspective. Yes. Um, but when this rocket goes up, Orion is on its way to the moon and nobody's here you know, on this stage anymore. What are you watching for as that mission progresses? Oh, everything, how the team works together. That's a big one. We have not flown a mission like this in complexity, in distance, uh, and also the international component of it in, in a very long time, and or, or some aspects ever. Uh, the International Space Station is very international, but having your astronauts only four or six hours away from the planet uh, is very different than a multi multiple day journey uh, to, to the moon and so or back. And so that how they work together and how they communicate and how they decide and act to handle problems is something that I'm going to be paying close attention to. If everything goes perfectly on this, actually, that to me would not be the best case. I want us to have some challenges that we work together and overcome so that we know we can do that, but then come back. And when that heat shield hits the atmosphere going Mach 32, 25,000 miles an hour or seven miles a second, we're gonna learn all that we need to know. And if it can keep the structure and the avionics and the, com the crew inside safe, then, uh, then I think we're well on our way a couple of years from now having a crew going to the moon as well. You're a military aviator. Yes, sir. And you have to fly by feel, right? Sometimes. You have to uh, adjust the plane in order to move to the direction that you're giving it as the pilot, right? Yes. Sometimes, yes. This will be automated. This is going to be more automated than any other spacecraft in history. Uh, you know, in Apollo, they had switches and knobs. Uh, here, people on the ground will be controlling a lot of the flight maneuvers and the path of the spacecraft. Yes. As somebody who has that background, how do you feel about that automation? Well, it's, it's, uh, there's actually, dip it depends on what phase you're talking about. Um, Orion has an ability to dock two things, other things could dock to it. And so there are regimes of flight where we can have full manual control. And there are regimes of flight where we would have a blended, some sharing between manual inputs and automation. And so there's a scale, a range of, of, of sharing of that responsibility. And I think that uh, that's the state of the practice, right? The state of the art is maybe one day gonna be, who knows, it's controlled by thoughts and, and folks on the ground, but uh, that's, that's the state of the practice. And so. That software has gotten much better. Uh, uh, hardware has gotten a whole lot better, our manufacturing capability. And so 
I think that's progress. And yes, as somebody who likes to have a stick and throttle, you know, I want to go up there and do aileron rolls in the thing, but the, the, the maneuvers it's going to do are so complicated that uh, for me to have manual control throughout the entire regime of flight actually adds risk that, that we aren't necessarily trying to buy off on. So we want manual control where it really matters. Things like docking, things like landing on the surface, uh, and then during entry to make sure that we have the ability to steer to a safe location to get us back down to earth safe. And so those regimes are, are thought about and, and, and sussed out by the team. And we work very hard to make sure we have the right capabilities during the right times. I have to ask, when will you know if you're <laughs> gonna get a shot at getting in the cockpit? Well, I mean, I guess philosophically, I know now I have a shot. Everybody in the astronaut office that's there now has a shot. And so that in and of itself is pretty cool. I mean, just to be where we are now and be a part of this team is truly an honor. And if your name gets called or not, I'm gonna be happy to still be a part of this team and help from the ground. Or if I'm at home on my couch watching from, you know, watching on NASA TV. Uh, but, you know, maybe sometime within the next year, I imagine they're going to make those announcements. If this is successful, uh, first things first, uh, we have a successful Artemis 1. The crew for Artemis 2 should be announced within a year. Uh, some people think it'll be a lot sooner than that. But, you know, I think we'll know. We'll, we'll feed the machine. The machine wants to know, I know. And, and we'll give you some names when it makes sense. How do you gauge mission success for Artemis 1 as you're watching this mission unfold over the next six weeks? Yeah. It's been a long road getting here, and we have overcome some significant challenges, schedule, uh, uh, regime change, political you know, uh, support, and all those things. And folks have done some amazing work to get us to this point. It is no small thing that we still have a moon-capable rocket and spacecraft through some of the changes that we've had in the last decade. And so the fact that we've overcome those things makes me the most confident in, in this group of people. Uh, human hands put that together human hands and minds and hearts and ears and eyes are going to be watching it and working it as it goes on this 42 day journey. And so uh, I'm confident in that team and we'll see how the hardware and software hold up. It's an unknown. We haven't done this before. Uh, this will be the first time a lot of this hardware is flying, but you notice there's some legacy out there. If you can see it in the distance, that orange tank is very similar to the, the shuttle main fuel tanks. And those boosters are very similar to shuttle solid rocket boosters. Uh, and so there's some, some heritage in our spaceflight hardware, but this is the first time it's been integrated into this stack up. And so we're going to learn, we're going to learn, but I have full confidence in that team. How do you explain this to your family? You know, I mean, they're closely, intimately connected to you. They're with, going through the process with you. Um, you know, when, when you're when you're home at night, talking to your family, you know, how do how do you explain the gravity of all this to them? Oh well, you know, I actually they no pun they, intended when I say the gravity the of this. Gravity, but you know yeah, what I mean? I, that good one, good one, by the way. <laughs> uh, well, the, I think the gravity of this moment and this effort is it, it kind of goes without explaining. I don't have to go into it, but I I do just get to talk to them about our family's part in that, right? And so. You know, we're watching with a, a little bit of a unique interest, right? We, we're sharing the same interest and, and, and inspiration the rest of the world is sharing. But at the same time, we're watching it with a little more scrutiny because our loved ones or our neighbors, our friends, our colleagues could be riding that to the moon next time. And so we really want to see that it works. Uh, so I think we have a keen interest in, in seeing, again, how this team works together and how they handle the challenges as they come, because there will be challenges. Uh, but ultimately... We want to see this uh, hardware and software be successful because at some point our friends and family are going to be flying on this thing to the moon. Knowing where you're at now, knowing what you might have the opportunity to do, what would you say to 12-year-old Victor Glover? Oh, wow. Oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> that's a great question. 12-year-old uh, Victor Glover didn't even know if college was a reality, you know, and just uh, no one in my family had graduated from college. And so there's, there's a lot to this iceberg and, and I'll save you uh, the, the long story and I'll just answer your question. What I would say to 12 year old me is it's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay, you're gonna be okay, but it's gonna be okay because you're gonna work so hard. And so um, that, that's what I would say to myself, you know, this will take care of itself, getting to this point, and, and the, the, the amazingness of this, the awe of it all, it will, it will take care of itself. You know, I wouldn't spoil the surprise. I would just let younger me know it, it's going to be okay. What do you want all of us to take away from what we see on Monday? It's, it's easy to look at that rocket and think, you know, it was just put together by these machines and these great tools. And we do have some amazing tooling like friction stir welding machines, you know, all that. I love that stuff. But it was put together by people. It was coded by people. Even the integration in that really tall building right there, the vehicle assembly building. When you saw the cranes lowering those pieces within inches of each other and then aligned and then put together, when those bolts were put in, they were put in by human hands. And so that, when this is flying to the moon, 
quarter million miles, and when it's making the quarter million mile trip back, hitting the atmosphere at 32 times the speed of sound. Uh, that was all done by human beings. And so I want you to be confident in that team, you know, and, and we are out here working hard for you because that's the people's rocket, right? And so, and we work for the people. And uh, I hope that America is proud of what we're doing and, and I hope it goes well and they continue to be proud uh, of what we're doing. We are, we are stewards of the public's good and resources and their time. And so I hope that they're following and I hope they continue to be proud of what we're doing. In that theme, you talked about it being the people's rocket. Also, just because we might not be able to fly on it doesn't mean we'll benefit, we won't benefit from the technology that might be in it, right? Because, you know, the Apollo program, the space shuttle program, all of these had um, uh, offspring benefits to us as a culture and a, and, and, a, and a people. Maybe, you know, are there, are there anything, there's anything you know about that's on that rocket that we might benefit from in the next 10 to 15 years? We're already benefiting from it right now. I mean, and there's, of course, there are going to be new developments. The materials that go into this, uh, some of the technology to communicate with it. Uh, we, we, we are constant benefactors of the space program in general. I mean, if you like your online, you know, shopping and banking and, you know, the, 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 the comforts of your car and the automation of some of those things, a lot of that has been impacted by aerospace and space specifically. Uh, and I think communication is one, you know, this thing is being beamed around the, the world at the speed of light because of that great satellite network that uh, is always overhead, allowing us to connect. And so um, the, the Artemis program specifically though, you know, our aim is to get to Mars. We're gonna get people to the moon to learn how to live on another uh, celestial body. And that's gonna enable us to go into Mars. And so some things that we have to do really well, we have to find water ice. And then we also have to be able to use our water effectively. On the International Space Station right now, we reclaim lots of our liquid, 80 to 90% of the fluids on the space station. We reclaim it, taking even the moisture out of the air. As I'm speaking right now, I know I'm giving you a long answer, so there's a lot of hot air here, but we can take that, the moisture out of that air and then pump it into our systems, clean it, and then get it, turn it into good drinking water. Well, guess what? Guess what one thing the whole world needs is access to clean water. And so some of the ways that we use electricity, turning the sun's light into energy to charge our batteries or to turn the lights in the space station on are some of the same technologies that allow this to go further and faster than a human rated spacecraft have gone before. And, and this spacecraft is different than Apollo in that it has uh, solar arrays on it. Those solar arrays enable us to go on 21 day missions, whereas in Apollo, the longest missions were about two weeks, 12 days, right? So the, the, the idea that I was just trying to wrap up there is that we already benefit from, from the technologies of programs like Artemis and, and we will continue but we all as people need to think about also like the processes that we, how we live our lives, the amount of energy we use, the amount of waste we create. And, and when you look at how we live in space, it's pretty austere, but we're, we also reduce, reuse, recycle where we can. And so the technology, but also the way we live in space are things that I hope we continue to learn from. Victor, man or people have not landed on the moon in our lifetime. Uh, that's about to change. Uh, do you think we will get to Mars in our lifetime? Oh, I think we will get to Mars in our lifetime. I said it a little while ago. This is a relay race. The journey to Mars has been 25 years away since we went to the moon back in the Apollo program. This is the first leg of the race to Mars. And so it's been 25 years ahead of us because we haven't started the race. When this is successful, we will have finished the first leg of that race and we'll be that much closer. I think it will happen in our lifetime. Uh, I think I may be too old to be on that crew, but to all those kids out there, be your best self. Listen to your mom and dad say please and thank you and eat your vegetables and exercise because those young kids are going to be the people that have a chance to put feet on Mars. Thank you very much for spending time with us here at The Voice of America. It's a pleasure to be able to talk to you and uh, good luck and Godspeed. Thanks, Kane. Great talking to you too.